and that's because we're going to remember we're going to umpire according to our priorities. And anybody remember what our priorities were? Ball strike, Ball fair strike. foul. Okay. Ball strike, Ball strike. Ball strike. Ball fair foul. Catch no catch. Safe out. Construction interference, auto <coughs> auto junk, right? So tonight what we'll do is safe out because we did all the other ones before. And then last week what we did was we talked about um, our seven laws of umpiring. Does anybody remember what they are? I don't remember. I'll have to look in my book. Anybody remember one of them? Seven laws. Seven laws. That's what we did last time, right? The seven laws of umpiring in our umpire manual. And if, as soon as you pay me your dues, I'll give you a book. Oh, angle, distance, that's right. Okay. Angle, angle over distance was one of them. I didn't get that book last year, Tony. Was that? We didn't get that book last no, year. No, uh-uh. This is a new, new, you know what you have here? Like I said, I, I'll sell you one Can I if you're a member already. Can I be like grandfather then for sitting in the class? Well, well, I gotta see the new member dues. The new member dues cover this, right? Which is I'll just share. Or you can. That's. I like to have my own though. I will sell you this book for. <coughs> what did I say? I think I can sell it for thirty, fifty, fifty dollars. I like the thirty. You yeah, started. Out. I'm trying to remember Who what I paid for. No, I didn't. I'm trying to remember what I paid for. I think I paid. I think we paid fifty. Oh, okay. And it's usually eighty. It's usually 80 when we pay 50. Anticipate the play, not the outcome. She's the cheating. Answer. She's looking at the book. There's nothing wrong with that. I have a book. What are you oh, about? she's looking at her notes. Don't mess with Jess, right? <laughs> Rule number one. No, she's got it on her phone. She's got her notes. It's good. Remember the first one was what? Um, anticipate. Anticipate. Anticipate the play, not the outcome. Not come to out outcome. Proper positioning is defined by. Angle and distance. Proper angle and distance. Angle. Over distance. Before distance, right? Angle before distance. Proper positioning is a function of time. Time. Three <laughs> positions for every play. Starting position, play position, adjusted position. Okay, three positions. The call is a mental process and the, the signal, signal is a physical, right? So don't be, make your call and then make your signal. And then the final one is no nothing's no routine till it's over, right? So those are all the things we went over last week, and I hope you had a chance to, again, if you, like I said, if you paid your dues, you should have the book. If you have paid and you don't have the book, holler at me. Why is this not moving? All right. Tonight what we're going to do is talk about safe out. Safe out, when we look at safe out, and basically I did a, a search in the rule book. The word safe does not appear, but like two times in the rule book as it refers to runners. So we don't define safe what we define out. So that means a runner who's not out is safe, right? That's the way, so if you look at the book. So that means what we have to do when we talk about a runner, we have to talk about, um, when we talk about safe and out, it's about runners, and there's two types of runners. Runners and batter runners. Okay, runners and batter runners. So what's a runner? Somebody that's already occupied a base. Okay. So this is from 273, so this is in the definitions. Rule 2 is definitions, okay? And rule 273, is and the high school book does things weird. They do them like words that fit together, not concepts that fit together. So rule two seven three is titled batters, batters box, batter runner. Why? Because it all has bat in it, which seems silly to me because I, I don't think I want bat batters box with batter and batter runner necessarily. A batters box is something else. But anyway. And they do it in other places. A batter runner is a player who's finished his time at bat until he's put out or until playing action ends. So that means a guy who was a batter, that's the guy that's standing preparing to hit, and we know about his strike zone. When he's finished his time at bat, he becomes a batter runner until that play ends. So what do you think it means to finish his time at bat? Either walks. Okay, if he if he gets if he gets an out, out, next batter gets up. Okay, so if he walks, he's finished his time ball, on ball four. He's finished his time at bat, and that makes him a batter, 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 batter runner, runner, right? Because there's it's important to know because there's that you put that on, right? Yes, sir. There's a difference between a bat. Have you talked to Tommy about what we're going to do about putting him up somewhere? Not really. All I know is he's in ball four. Again? Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting tired, Tom. <laughs> Um, batter. Go in the club. <laughs> There's a batter and a batter. Um, where were we? Batter runner. 
There's a difference when a batter runner, there are certain rules that apply to batter runners that don't apply to runners, and certain rules that apply to runners that don't apply to batter runners. So the difference between a batter runner and a runner can be important. Okay, because there's certain things batter runners can't do that runners can, and there's certain things that runners can do that batter runners can't do, and then there's some things that batter runners and runners can both do. So it becomes important in certain circumstances. So a batter runner is a player who's finished his time at bat until he is put out or until playing action ends. So he could finish ball four, he instantly becomes a batter runner. Strike three, the instant strike three happens, he becomes a batter runner. So if he swings at a pitch and it's strike three, he becomes a batter runner. Okay, so, so he becomes a batter runner. If he hits the baseball, fair ball, actually catchable ball, even till the ball's dead, right, till playing action ends, he hits the ball, he's a batter runner. Okay? And, and so basically, batter, batter happens when his time ends. 230 tells us about run, runners, and retired runners. Like I said, what run has to do with, we know what run has to do with runners, but run, run, and retired runners. A runner is a player of the team at bat who has finished his time at bat and has not yet been put out. The term batter runner, in, the term includes the batter runner and also any runner who occupies a base. So notice now there's certain times in our high school rule book when batter runner and runner mean the same thing. Well, a batter runner can be a runner, but a runner can't necessarily be a batter runner. A, a batter runner can be a runner, but a runner can't be a batter runner. And again, it seems silly, but it's going to make a difference on, under certain circumstances. So just something to keep in mind, okay? A retired runner is a player of the team at bat who has been put out or has scored and is still in the live ball area. So runner, a retired runner, and there are things that retired runners can and can't do. So we have to understand what a retired runner is. Okay? <clears throat> so let's talk about a put out. Okay, because remember we're talking about out safe, so we're, the, the rule book calls it a put out. It's rule 224-1. Okay. A put out is the act of a fielder in retiring a batter or a runner. Okay, which in this case would include batter runner. Right? Which would include batter runner. So that's what a put out is. Okay. There's four types of put outs. How many of you knew that? Can you think of them? Four types of put-outs. Four types of put-outs. Okay. Force, 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 force. We have a tag out. Force. Force. Force, force out. Catch. Uh, Raw. Ground fly. Uh, Blood. No. Uh, ground out. Strike out. Strike out. Uh, fly out. Fly out. No. Foul out. Foul out. Uh, <laughs> Okay, let's find out. Okay, let's find out. Force out. So we bet we're going to learn about what a force out is. Tag out. Did we have that one? Yeah. That's the one we. No, I don't think we did. Nope, that's the one we missed. Tag out. Did we say tag out? Yeah, we had tag out. If you're in West, if you're in Pennsylvania, certain parts of Pennsylvania, he didn't get tagged. He got tugged. Just in case you want to know. If so, if you ever hang around a Pennsylvania umpire and said he tugged him, that's the past presence of tag. The tug, right? Am I lying? It's tug. It's tug. Okay. Throw out. We didn't have that. We didn't have that. And then finally, strike out. Those are the four kinds of put outs there are. Those are the four kinds of put out there are. Force out, tag out, throw out, strike out. Force out. Right? Force out. Force out is a put out during which a runner who is being forced to advance is tagged out or is put out by a fielder who holds the ball while touching the base towards which the forced runner is advancing. That goes okay. back to the fly. The way we were talking, we're talking about, about right. so a force out can only happen going 
To a base. Forward, right? It can only happen going forward. Right? And the guys have to run the bases, and we didn't do this, but we'll get to this. If you look at how do you score a run, the runners have to legally run the bases in order. Okay? Legally run the bases in order, touch all of them, and then be safe. Touch all of them because if they don't touch them and nobody appeals them, you could spin around in a circle, hit a home run, spin around in a circle, step on the plate, walk in the dugout. If nobody goes, hey, wait a minute, he can't do that, then the run scores. That's what appeals are for. That's what appeals are for. All right. Again, put out which the runner is forced to advance, is tagged out, or is put out by a fielder who holds the ball while touching the base towards which the forced runner is advancing. So if he's holding the ball and he touches the base, he doesn't have to touch it with his foot, he can touch it with any piece of him. Because I actually saw an umpire say once that the guy wasn't out at first base because the fielder caught the ball falling down and reached over and touched it with his hand. I won't tell you who it is. Kevin knows who he is. Touched the ball, and he said it wasn't a force out because he had to touch it with his foot. <clears throat> you can't make this stuff up. You can't make this stuff up. Force out. What's a force play? Because <clears throat> that's part of this force out. A force play, depth from rule 229.3, goes with a force out. A force play is a play in which a runner, or two or three runners, loses his right to the base, he occupies, and again, this violates all the rules of PowerPoint presentations, but I'm giving you the whole rule. Okay, I'm giving you the whole rule. If we had our own rule book, we wouldn't have, we could say, we could all look and read it ourselves. Forced to advance because the batter becomes a batter runner. When does a batter become a batter runner? We talked about earlier, ball four, hits the ball, the second he strike three, He's the second he swings his strike three, he's become a batter runner. Okay. For a given runner, a force play ends as soon as he touches the next base. As soon as he touches the next base, the force run, he's, he's no longer forced. Um, or a following runner is put out at a previous base. So what does that mean? If you have a runner on first and second, and the batter puts the ball in play. Now you're forced to advance to third. They make the play. Let's suppose the ball gets caught in the air. By our definition of catch, no catch, the batter runner is now out. So as a preceding runner, is that what it says? Preceding runner? Previous. 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 I'm sorry. A previous runner, for a given runner, for as soon as he touches the next base, or a following runner, I'm getting ahead of myself for a preceding runner, a following runner, a trailing runner, is put out. Well, if the batter hits a fly ball, he's now a batter runner. If the ball's caught, he's out. So has a following runner been put out? Is the guy from second forced to advance to third anymore? So suppose we got a ground ball and we tag the guy out from first base and you're on second base. Is he forced to advance anymore? Not forced to advance anymore. Okay? So he has to be forced to advance until a following runner, until he touches his next base or a following runner is put out at a previous base. If a runner advances beyond the base to which he's forced without touching it, so I'm running to, I'm at first base, the batter hits, hits the ball, I'm running to second base, I go past second base, I pass second base but I don't touch it, the force play remains. The force play remains. This is an interesting rule, we're going to come back to this, because they don't really mean what they say right here. Runners on first base. Ground ball to the first baseman. He tags first. Oh, diff runner. That different. Now uh, uh, th there's a following runner is out. Uh -huh. Now he doesn't have to go to second anymore. I was getting ready to ask you. He, he could go back anymore. to first. He could go back to first. Okay. Hmm.
The force play remains. Also, a force situation is reinstated when a runner retreats past the base to which he was forced in advance. So let's suppose I'm running the second because I was forced. And I go, oh no, and I turn around and I start running back to first. The force play is now reinstated again. Okay. Yeah, situation or or where a or ball's say not called. what's that? Situation where a ball's not called. And yeah, the, the classic one would be this. Let's suppose I'm running, fly ball to the outfield. Okay, fly ball to the outfield. I round second base. Oops. Okay, I round second base, and I go, oh no, he's going to catch the ball. And then I come back around second, going back toward first. And so now I'm between first and second again, running toward first and the fielder drops the ball. The batter runner's not out anymore. But now I can't go back to first because the following runner's a runner, so now I'm forced to advance the second the force is advanced. This first one is going to require a little bit of clarification. The, if I miss the base, the force is still in play. That, that, that one's interesting because it depends on for what reason we want the force to stay in play. So for the purpose of scoring runs, you see why rule books are difficult, because there's a whole bunch of stuff that's written here that we're not going to know until we know what forcing, what, a, what it means to score a run, and what it means to <coughs> appeal. And if we don't know those two things, this sentence here is not going to make sense to us. Because that doesn't mean if, say, I'm running to, say we got a ground ball hit to the, um, it's a hit and run, and I'm running from first base, and I round second, and I keep going to third, because the ball was hit to the second baseman way over to his left. I miss the base, and then the guy throws the ball, the, then he looks, and the batter runner's safe at first, and because he's out in the outfield somewhere, he throws it into the shortstop because he's the cutoff guy going to third, and he's standing on the base and catches the ball. That guy's not out. Not until you appear. It, it appears as if from the, when you read that rule, that he's out. He's not out. Because now you have to appeal that that guy, you have to say, hey, dude, he missed the base. In which case, now that's a force out, and if that was a third out and a run had scored, that run would come off the board. That's where that matters, and we will get there. Most of you know that, but we're going to get there. We're going to have to understand all that, okay? And we've only done... So here's a situation, right? And I grabbed the case thing, and we'll go back and look at the case. With one out and a runner on first base, batter hits some fly ball to short left field. Runner from first rounds second, but retreats toward first when he thinks the ball will be caught. The ball drops. F7, the left fielder, retrieves the ball, throws it to second. R1 is between first and second. We just, the one we just made up, right? It's almost like I knew what I was coming on the PowerPoint. Like I paid attention last night when I cut and paste. Okay. Ruling, that guy's out because the force was reinstated when he retreated. All right, second kind of out. Tag, yes. All right, can I go back to that situation for a second? It's reinstated because he rounds second, so therefore there'd be no force on him because there's nobody behind him. But when he comes back... I remember the ball got dropped. Right. But he sees his drop, he comes back, that's when it gets reinforced again. Just be, basically, the, the ball second is null and void. The, the ball... No, the, no yeah, when he goes back the other way, he, it's as if he never touched second. Okay. But if the ball is caught, it doesn't matter. Right. Because he's not forced at second base anymore. Now we have a different situation. The key is the ball is on the ground. The batter runner is still moving, can still go to first base. The batter runner is entitled to first base. Right. Until he's put out. I guess I don't understand why, why it's being reinstated when his force wouldn't be removed until the fielder caught the ball anyway. Well, suppose it's a suppose it's a suppose it's a base hit line drive, hit and run, and he gets deked by the left fielder, right. who goes whoa like this and go and the guy goes whoa puts on the brakes after he touches the base and starts to head back to first. Okay. So now he's in between first and second. Right. So now since he's in between first and second, he has put the force back on himself. 
because the only one way he can go is forward. Right. So he has to go to second base before he can go to third. And since he has to go to second base before he can go to third, he's now been forced to second base, even though he already touched second base once. Or twice. Or twice. If he really did it right, he could have touched it twice. Okay. So he erases his touch when he goes back toward first. So it just keeps on being like, oh, I've touched second already. Touched right, yeah. Tag out. It's 224. A tag out is a put out of a runner, including the batter runner, who is not in contact with his base <coughs> when touched with a live ball. So that means at some point we're going to have to know what live ball means, right? At some point we're going to have to know what live ball means. Or with the glove or hand when the ball is held securely therein by a fielder. So you got to hold it in the glove and touch him with the glove, or hold it in the hand and touch him with the hand. Okay? The ball is not considered as having been securely held if it is juggled or dropped after the touching unless the runner deliberately knocks the ball. So this goes back to our voluntary release, right? Firm and secure possession and voluntary release. So if you reach out, if a runner, a fielder reaches out, tags a guy, and he goes like this, and the ball falls out. As long as that guy didn't punch him or hit him or knock it out, then he's safe. And so we have to have firm and secure possession after a tag. We have to have firm and secure possession after a tag. All the way through the tag play. Voluntary release. Or at least the, he came under the same kind of thing. He came under control and could, you know, holding up the ball like this to you going, look, I have the ball is the same as voluntary release. Okay? Good? Cap? Okay. Made a funny face. Mm -hmm. The best part about teaching this stuff is having to reread it and redo it and re-understand re it again. That's the best part about it. Throw out. What the heck is a throw out? None of us had the idea of throw out, right? I, I certainly didn't think of it when I went through this yesterday. I'm sure you didn't come up with throw out, did you? No, no I <laughs> Okay. Throw I thought out. I was force out. A throw out is a put out caused by a throw to first base to retire a batter runner or to any other base to which a runner is forced or is required to retouch. Whoa! Why is that a force out? Okay, remember I told you a play on the batter runner at first base was not a force out? We were kind of in passing, we said that? It's, it's a throw out. It's not a force out. Why? Because the batter runner can't be forced to advance to first base. Because what was the definition of a force? A runner lost his right to the base by virtue of the batter becoming a runner. So how can the batter runner lose his right to the plate by virtue of the batter runner becoming a runner? It doesn't make any sense. So what the high school book does is call, and all the other books... <laughs> won't call that a force out, so you can't have force outs at first base. Now, that being said, most of the time when we talk about it, we'll call that thing a force out. When we talk about mechanics, <clears throat> we'll, talk, we'll call that a force out, but it's not it's a throw out. Now, I'd have to go look at the college rule book and the high school rule, the pro book to see if it's the same. The, interpret, the, the ideas are the same. I don't know if the words are the same. I'd have to look in the college book to see if it was the same. I don't have my college book with me, or my pro book yet. So you're tagging up. That would be a throw out, not That'd a force out. That would be a throw out, out <laughs> not a force out. Okay, so a, a force out could be a throw out. Right? A force out yeah. could be a throw out, but throw outs aren't necessarily force outs. Is this like a pickoff? Would this be considered a pickoff? Um, no, no because tag. this is a put out caused by a throw to first base to retire a batter runner. Okay. So really what it is, or a throw to any other base. So this is a place where you can touch the base to put a guy out. Okay. You don't have to physically tag the runner. He ain't got to be tug, right? As they say in Pennsylvania, you don't have to be tug. Go ahead. No, I was just saying, um, it sounds like it's more of a situation where Say a ball's hit the left field, guy's on third, tags up, gets thrown out at home on the throw. Would that fit? Um, that no, that would be a tag out. Tag okay. out. That would be a tag out. He's okay. got to put the tag on him. 
to get him out. Tag out. Okay. So here, what makes the throw out a throw out is that the base can be touched okay. instead of the run. So if he's going back, if, if he's going back, back to third, okay. and then we catch the ball and tag the base, and it's a throw out. If he's moving the third, it's a force it, it out. It could be a force out, which could be, which is a throw out, right? Force right. outs are throw outs, okay. but not all throw outs are force outs. Wait, did we do this in geometry in high school? Did we have Venn diagrams? That was algebra, right? Venn diagrams. <laughs> <laughs> so the set, the set force out is contained within the set of throw out, but th the intersecting set of strike out. Easy. No. That was easy, right? Yeah. Strike out is the result of the pitcher getting <coughs> strike free charge to the batter. But we have to have something else. Strike three doesn't make the batter out. The catcher drops. Uh, catcher, the, the, catcher, the catcher has the catcher. So this usually results in the batter being out, but does not result, so result that the third strike is not caught and the batter runner re legally reaches first base. So that's why I said when a guy swings and misses at strike three, he immediately becomes a batter runner. Now he has to be put out. One way to put him out is for the catcher to firmly and securely possess the ball after strike three. Another would be if he does not catch, legally catch the ball, to tag him. Is that a tag out? That's a tag out. Or to throw, throw, out. Throw, out. throw out. So he can be put out by a catch, a tag out, or a throw out on a strikeout. So he can be out four different ways, right? All right, now here's when a runner is out. So now we know the definitions of outs. So rule 8-4, eight, 8-4, four, eight, four, we're going to look at 8-4-1 and 8-4-2. <coughs> and we're just going to go through all the things in the list. And if we have some time, we'll go back and I'll show you some case sets from the rule book. It'll give you some plays to imagine. Okay, and then we'll just go to the case sets in the rule book. Okay, 8-4, <coughs> and if you look at rules, when you open the rule book, if you look at, and there's two books, a case book and a rule book, okay. and the case book has plays pertinent to the rule book. If you look at rule 8-4, and I know you can't see that up there, it says, runner is out is the name of the rule, and then it says, uh, the batter is out when, so we have article 1, the batter is out when, and then there is, under article 1, there's A, B, C, D, E, H, J, M, N, O, P, Q, R. Okay? No, I'm sorry, K. We go to K in rule one. In rule two, we go to R. So all of those are underneath. So A through K is underneath the batter runner is out when. So let's find out when the batter runner is out. The batter runner is out when he intentionally interferes with the catcher's attempt to field the ball after a third strike. That seems like logic, common sense, and fair play. We've talked about that concept before. If you don't know what to do, Think about what would common sense and fair play say. If the catcher is trying to put a guy out and the batter reaches over and whacks him in the head with the bat, we could probably call that dude out, right? Or if he reaches over and hits him in the glove with the bat, we could probably call that guy out. Or if the catcher is trying to pick up the ball and the hitter kicks it away from him, we could probably call that guy out. Or if he hits it with his bat, we could probably call that guy out. Right? Gets in front of the catcher, bumps into him on purpose, we could probably call that guy out. Okay, but notice it says, intentionally interferes with the catcher's attempt to field the ball after a third strike. So at some point we're going to have to know what field the ball means too, by the way. Is hit, his fair hit or foul, other than a foul tip, which is not a third strike. So we remember when we talked about foul tip, we know what a foul tip is, right? It's a ball that goes sharply and directly to the catcher's hands and then is legally caught right? by, in our rule book, do you remember, does the catcher have to catch it or can the pitcher catch it? You don't want it. I want to check on that one. I'm not going to tell you. Catcher. Remember, on one of the rule books, it can bounce off the catcher and go to the pitcher, oh, and the pitcher can catch it. That's the high school one. <coughs> 
pretty sure you got to know, right? For that one time in a billion, you might see it in your career, at which point you mark that off the list of things I haven't seen before and then move along, right? Okay. His fair hit or foul that's not a third strike is caught by a fielder, so that means a runner is out when a fair is caught, and we already know what catch is because we went through catch, no catch, right? We already know what caught means. Or such catch is prevented by a spectator reaching into the playing field. Okay, so we have, there's a special rule for that. It's called spectator interference. So if the guy's waiting to catch the ball, spectator reaches in and grabs the ball, then we're still going to call the guy out. Get your batter out. Okay. C, his fair fly, fair line drive, or fair bunt in flight is intentionally dropped by an infielder with at least first base occupied and before there are two outs. The ball is dead, and the runner or runner shall return to their respective bases. A lot going on in there. Okay. So here's what happens. This is a rule. Think about what this rule is meant to prevent, and it's easy to understand. Suppose I'm a second baseman, and you hit me a little loopy line drive. And the runner from, there's a runner on first. He's not going to run, is he? So suppose I go like this with the ball. Put it down on the ground pick it up, throw it to second, that guy's out, turn around, get a double play. <coughs> or I got a line drive, the line drive's hit right at the second baseman. Boom, and he goes, and knocks it down on the ground right in front of him. He's going to get two outs instead of one out, and he really only deserves one out because of the nature of the game. We've decided that's cheating, and we don't want you to do that. So if he intentionally drops it, the ball's dead, so we're going to have to learn about dead ball, live ball again. Ball's dead. Basically, a ball's dead means no more playing action can happen. So the ball can either be alive and in play or dead. If it's alive and in play, okay, if it's alive and in play, all the things that can happen, happen. If it's dead, not, very little can happen. There's, a, there's some things that can happen when the ball's dead. There's a whole bunch of stuff that can't happen when the ball's dead. And we'll get to that when we talk about live ball, dead ball. High school and college have a thing in between called delayed dead, which just means alive and in play. It means when, the, when everything's all done, then we'll say dead. So alive and in play, dead. That's the easiest way to think about it. But delayed dead means we're going to wait a minute and then we're going to kill it. So the ball is dead and runners advance. Got to be careful. Intentionally dropped. Intentionally dropped. Is it a judgment call here? Nope. Well, yes, of course it's a judgment call. But intentionally dropped doesn't mean, say, I got the pop up and I'm the second baseman and I go boop, 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 and I don't touch it and I let it fall on the ground. That's not intentionally dropped. However, there's another rule for that. Well, it depends if there's runners on first and second. If I got a runner on first, I got a little pop up to me and I'm the second right. baseman and I just go like this and right. let it fall. First only now. First only, I can have this with first only, first and second, or bases loaded. But we'll come back to first and second, and we'll come back to bases loaded. If I have a runner on first only, fly balls hit, pop ups hit to me, and I'm the second baseman, and I don't touch it, and I let it fall untouched, fall untouched is not intentionally dropped. Intentionally dropped means I go, you see me, I go, oh, oh. That, that happened in the big leagues. Um, dude from Cincinnati tried it. I saw it one time this year. If Chase Utley does it all the time. Yeah, you, the time. You, but you can, if you look around, if we searched for it, we can find a video of it. If you go search for intentionally drop ball on YouTube, you'll find a video of a guy doing that. Okay, Big leagues, it doesn't happen a lot because usually that earns you a ball in the ear hole. Don't do that. that don't do that stuff. But out here, and then I've only seen it once and twice in my entire career. And one time I saw it, I never even thought about umpire, but my third baseman did it when I was a kid, when I was 15 years old. I thought, man, that's really smart. We ended up with a triple play. Because <laughs> we had runners on first and second. He went, <laughs> but stepped on second, third, threw it to second, got first, we got a triple play. I don't think the umpire knew the rule, but we got a triple play out of it, which was pretty cool. <laughs> Question, um, when it comes to something like a night game in that particular situation, is it a judgment call at that point if you lose it? I nights? mean, if he goes like this, what we're talking about, you'll know it when you okay. see it, because what will happen is the guy will go, and you'll see him, he'll guide okay. the ball to the ground, right? He'll, gotcha. You'll see him, because what's he trying to do? He wants it to touch the ground close so enough to up. pick it up. Right. So you'll see it. Okay. I mean, and again, 
How often does this happen? Almost never. Have you ever had it? I've had it once or Not twice. intentionally on the pop fly, because on the pop fly, the ball is up and coming down. The runner has an opportunity to get the first. On a line drive, he really doesn't have an opportunity. So it freezes, but he kind of, he hasn't had time to move, and it's frozen him. That's where you can get the double play. Okay. On a pop-up like that, if second doesn't move because he thinks it's going to ca catch, and the, the guy at first doesn't run because he's stupid, then you deserve to get two outs. Right. But if he's running, he's not going to be able to let that ball drop, flip the second, and get that guy for right. They're only going to get one out there. It's just right. a matter of which a one they go. line drives when you're really going to... Yeah, it's a time issue. You're, you're not going to see it on a pop-up. Generally, yeah. you're going to speak on yeah. a line drive. Okay. So here's... here's yeah. Okay, and then the rules are broken into Article 1. So we would call this 8-4-1A1. And so this whole thing would be written out. So underneath this is, in this situation, the batter's not out if the infielder permits the fair fly, fair line drive, or fair bite and fight to drop untouched to the ground, except when the infield fly rule applies. And we haven't talked about infield fly rule. Yeah, we did, right? We went over the whole infield fly rule one day, the first day, so we understand that. If the infield fly rule applies, you can intentionally drop the ball. Because why? As soon as we call it infield fly, the batter runners out, so that means there are no more force outs. So if he wants to let the ball, if he wants to intentionally drop it, good on him. Have fun. You're not hurting anything. Okay? So the infield fly rule takes precedence over the dropped, intentionally dropped ball rule. Come on. And that, that rule is only effective for infielders. Drop by an infielder, right? Yes. So the outfielder technically... If he's playing on the infield... Field. Look, if you've got, a, if you've got an outfielder position. playing right up yeah. against the rim and he goes boom like that, you, you, you have common sense That's and fair play will go, let's go. You, you can't do that. All right, runners out when D. After hitting or bunting a ball, he intentionally contacts the ball with intentionally contacts the ball with the bat a second time in fair or foul territory. The ball is in dead. So if he hits the ball and then and then he intentionally hits it again, whether it's fair or foul, he's out. So say, how are you going to see this? He swings. The ball's bounding around the ground, and he throws his bat at it. Throws his bat at it. Does this happen? Again, common sense and fair play would tell you if you see a runner, a batter, throw the bat at the ball and he hits the ball, dude, you can't do that, right? Again, it's not going to happen to you all that often. In the case of a foul ball, it must have a chance to become fair. So, if, And here's what we're trying to avoid. And this is why they wrote the rule and then some guy who wasn't very well trained in umpiring thought he read exactly what the rule said, black and white. Because one of the things we don't want to be is what's called the black and white rule umpire. Every rule has to be tempered by the way the game is being played. So what happens sometimes, I guarantee you why this got put in there, some guy hit a foul ball, and the ball was dribbling up the line, okay, it was dribbling up the line, and it was five or six feet foul, and it was going to keep rolling foul. The batter reached over with his bat, hit the bat ball to pick it up to give it back to the catcher. And an umpire said, you're out. Because it says, fair foul, foul ball, intentionally hit with the bat, right? So somebody said, some umpire, over officious umpire, said, okay, you're out. Or worse than that, one got hit right down in his feet and was spinning, hadn't stopped moving yet, and he hit, hit it with the bat to give it back to the catcher. I guarantee you something like that happened. So, again, we should temper, temper up with the way we look. If the bat and ball accidentally come in contact with each other a second time when the batter is holding the bat in the batter's box, it's a foul. We've all seen that, right? He swings, and the ball goes boom, boom, and comes right back up and hit the bat. If he's in the batter's box and it's unintentional, it's a foul ball. It's a foul ball. And we've already know foul ball rule. Runner is out, a third strike is caught by the catcher, or a third strike is not caught when first base is occupied and there are less than two outs. So if there's less than two outs, strike three, the catcher does not have to legally catch the ball. The catcher does not legally have to catch the ball. If there's two outs, the catcher always has to legally catch the ball. 
If first base is unoccupied, first base is unoccupied. At the time of the pitch. At, at the time of the pitch, which means now we have to learn what? He's still in second. What time of the pitch means. So a runner that's stealing second, first base, still occupied. first base is occupied at the time of the pitch. Okay, Hit and run, something like that. Even if he touches second and he's on his way to third, by the time pitch gets there, if he was at first base at the time of the pitch, first base was occupied. So we're going to have to understand at some point what this time of pitch means. Okay? After a drop third strike, oh, by the way, if he drops this and there's two outs, all the other runners are now, if there's a runner on first, he's forced to advance to second. If there's a runner on first and second, the runner on second's forced to advance to third. And if the bases are loaded, the runner from third is advanced, forced to advance home. So that means now since the batter has become a runner and all those guys are forced, the catcher can make an out by touching the plate. Or throwing the third or throwing the second. Or he can get a throw out at first. Alright, a runner is a batter runner is also out when after a drop third strike or a fair hit, if the ball held by any fielder touches the batter before the batter touches first base. We already knew that, but I guarantee you this had to be put in because somebody called the guy safe because it said you had to touch the base. So Batter touches, or if any fielder while holding the ball in his grasp touches first base or touches first base with the ball before the batter runner touches first base. Before the batter runner touches first base. Okay? And by the way, so we can be done with it, there's no such thing as a tie. And if you want to say tie goes to, tie goes to the umpire. Tie goes to the umpire. Ties are out. Okay? If, if, if it's tied, he's out. Most of the time. All right. A runner is out. This is still a batter runner. He runs outside the three-foot running lane, the last half of the distance from home plate to first, while the ball is fielded or <coughs> thrown to first base, or, so we're not done yet, so you know that little lane that they have drawn on there? It's called the runner's lane. It's three feet wide. It starts 45 feet from the plate and goes to three feet beyond first base. Did you know that? It's also supposed to go to three feet beyond first base, which makes one of the interpretations we have kind of goofy, but we'll still stick with it. He's got to run within that lane on his way to first base under certain circumstances. The infraction, so he can run, he has to run, and he only has to run in the last half, he has to run within that lane. So the rule, by the way, we'll get, we'll get to this when we talk about interference. Within means between the two white lines. Outside means in foul territory. Inside means in fair territory. So we have inside, within, outside. And we're going to get, when we get to interference, we'll talk about that. The infraction is no, ignored if it is to avoid the fielder who is attempting to field the batted ball. And I got a really cool play in my plays. Two back-to-back -back plays on this exact thing I'll show you. And you'll, you'll lose your, they're pretty amazing to look at what's going on in these two plays. Because they're so similar. Um, if I'm running up the third first baseline it, within the lane and the pitcher's bent over to pick up the ball, I can't run him over. I have to give him the opportunity to field the ball, and that's going to happen at any base. So if I get out of that lane to avoid a fielder, right, to field the ball, or if the act does not interfere with a fielder or throw. So if I don't interfere with a fielder or a throw, I can run anywhere I want. So that means now we're going to have to go find out what interference means and what it means to interfere with a fielder or a throw. But guess what? We're not there yet because we, we would end up chasing the rule book around in circles if every time we ran into something we went and followed something else. I'm, I'm trying not to chase the rule book around in circles because you can see it can be very easy to do. 
And by the way, you want to know why most people don't know the rules and don't understand the rules? We haven't made it through one rule yet where we haven't had to go look at another rule, at least, and most of the time, more than one rule, to bring back in what that rule belongs to. The batter runner is considered outside the running lanes if either foot is outside either line. So if he's got a foot outside the line, he's not within. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. Okay. A batter runner is out when any runner or retired runner interferes in a way which obviously hinders an obvious double play. So that's actually the Jackie Robinson rule. You, Jackie Robinson once was going to be out on a double play. The second baseman was going to field the ball, throw, throw him out at second, and he's going to throw the guy at first, so Robinson reached up and whacked the dude. Said, at the time, the rule just said one guy was out, so Robinson just whacked the dude. And so now he couldn't throw to first base for the double play. And somebody said, wait a minute, that's not fair. He was going to get a double play just because you interfered. Because the way the rule is written is if I interfere with a player, the ball's dead, the batter runner goes to first, all other runners return. So Robinson was smart. He ran into the guy so that he couldn't turn a double play. And they said, wait a minute, you can't, you can't do that. Then how do we have so broken now, up double plays there? Broken up double plays are different because that's not interference. That's interpreting what interference means. What Robinson did was not just interfere. Like he, inter he went up and grabbed the, the dude or whacked the dude. He didn't or slide into the dude. No, slide into him is not interference. Okay. Except in high school baseball. So we're going to get, get to that because we have another, we have another rule we got to look at. On a drop third strike, he gives up. Okay, so on a drop third strike, and it should say not caught third strike because if it skips into his glove, it's not dropped, but it can't be caught. Because remember, a ball to be caught has to be in flight, and if it hits the ground, is it in flight anymore? No. Okay. So it's not. It's not in flight. So if he, if he. If there's an uncaught third strike and he doesn't know it and he starts to wander away, now in every other rule book, if he wanders out of the circle, as soon as he gets out of the circle, he's given up his right to go to first base. It used to be he could get all the way into the door into the dugout before he gave up his right to run to first base. And we got tired of watching that, so he said, look, once he leaves the circle, he's out. But in high school baseball, he gives up by entering the bench or dugout area. So that means in high school baseball, if you swing, say swing, and you don't know he dropped it, and the catcher's chasing the ball back there and you don't know, and you start walking toward the dugout, until you get into the dugout, you could go, oh, crap, and run to first base. Okay? With two outs, he does not attempt to reach first base before all infielders have left the diamond or all the infielders, because they think it's three outs, they all, all the infielders leave the diamond. How many times are you going to see this in your life? The second one, zero, but you have to be aware of it. How many times are you going to see this one infrequently, but it happens once in a while, where a guy starts wandering toward the dugout and everybody's yelling, run, 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 run. He goes, oh, and he starts running. That happens. So we, and it happened enough times in other rule books that they changed it. And the two other rule books, as soon as you leave the dirt circle, around the plate, 12-foot dirt circle, 13-foot dirt circle around the plate, you're out. You can't then start running. Hits an infield fly, and the infield fly is in effect. These are all batter runners out. How many did I say there was? K? K. K? Enters the game as an illegal substitute and is discovered. Oops. So that means we have to know what when substitutes legal, are when's legal. legal and not legal, okay? All right. Part two. Let's take a break. <coughs> take five minutes, have us some blueberry cobbler. I can meet